Hello, my name is John Bloom, and I'm here today to describe a pilot study using a novel platform for proteomics profiling to look for novel candidate biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment. This was a study that was done by the employees of CIR Incorporated, as well as Biogen Incorporated. CIR developed the plasma profiling platform and Biogen helped us selecting the samples. Proteomics is important. And for some, this may be an obvious statement, but for others, perhaps not so. Genomics, which allows for the easy collection of a large amount of genetic information has really excelled over the last two decades. And the ease of collection has enabled vast amounts of data to be collected. Unfortunately, proteomics has not expanded quite as dramatically, although there's great utility because proteins are the signalers, the actors, the structural elements. There's great utility there. The difficulty of collecting information has really limited its expansion. In addition to the difficulty of collecting, we have this problem of the diversity of what we're trying to detect information about. There is no such thing as one protein per gene. There are many proteins or proteoforms that come from a gene created by differences in RNA processing, differences in translation, differences in post-translational modification. There are an estimated 1 million different proteoform variants. And so trying to make an analyte specific reagent for each of these is not tractable. In addition to the sheer number of things that are available to detect, they also range across quite a large numbers of orders of magnitude in plasma where we typically look for candidate biomarkers. In plasma, more than 10 orders of magnitude of concentration are found ranging from albumin as the most abundant protein on down to cytokines as the least abundant proteins. The reason this is a problem for detection is because typical unbiased proteomics profiling tools, which are based on mass spec, have detectors that only have four orders of magnitude of range. And so if I shoot this into a mass spec, I will typically just observe the most abundant proteins. And that is evidenced by the fact that the top 22 proteins are, are almost 99% of the total mass. Now, unfortunately, to solve this, people have created more and more complex workflows. And the problem has been as they get deeper into individual samples, those workflows make it impossible to do large studies in many samples. That's the problem that we've tried to resolve. That's the problem that we've solved in the study that we're describing today. Our technology platform is based off of nanoparticles, which as the name implies are very small, about 100 nanometers in size. As we make them, they have a magnetic core so that we can handle them. They have a changeable surface. And as that surface changes, they selectively and specifically bind analytes out of solution. So as is shown here on the left-hand side, when a nanoparticle is introduced to a biofluid, such as plasma or serum or cerebrospinal fluid or saliva, a corona or shell of proteins are bound on top of that nanoparticle. Each nanoparticle, as I said, selectively and specifically binds them, but it binds them not just by concentration. If that were true, they would just bind albumin. What actually happens with nanoparticles is that high abundance proteins that bind are displaced by lower abundance proteins with higher affinity. In effect, we normalize concentration by binding affinity. The net result of that is to replace the very complex workflows that I referred to on the prior slide. So now one can rapidly and specifically interrogate in an unbiased fashion, proteins out of a sample, process more samples and do better studies. We have created a tool that has five of these nanoparticles that we've selected from a library of more than 250. And as you can see in this figure, matching how well uh, conceptually they interrogate the human plasma proteome database of proteins, we sample from the highest abundance proteins to the lowest abundance proteins. This group works well together and in our platform, all five of these are used individually on plasma samples. That process looks like this. It's about a seven hour process that's been automated with very little hands-on time required across that seven hours. In the first step, nanoparticles and plasma are mixed in a 96 well plate. There's about a one hour incubation at normal temperature and near physiologic conditions, allowing the corona to form and the compression to happen. After that step, there's a washing step in which after magnetic capture, the proteins that have not bound into the corona shell are removed. In the third step, proteins are digested to peptides, netting a solution of peptides that's ready for mass spec preparation and downstream data analysis. Now we've applied this tool to go look at the problem of the development of molecular markers for Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment. And the challenge here is that most of these studies assign patients into groups based primarily on subjective criteria such as cognitive ability and memory. 
We acquired a group of samples, 200 samples from a contract research organization that were collected under their IRB approved protocol. And you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, the general inclusion and exclusion criteria. But perhaps more importantly, if you look at the classification criteria that were used for AD versus MCI, as I said, these are fairly subjective. We would like to develop better candidate biomarkers so that we can have a molecular basis for assignment of class rather than a subjective basis. In the study, since we're gonna compare these groups, we've affirmed that they are age and gender matched. You can see there's really no clinically significant difference in the median age across the groups, nor is there any clinically meaningful difference in the gender distribution across the groups. We processed these 200 samples in about six weeks of calendar time. And this is really the big win with respect to going forward with candidate biomarker studies like this. One can look at large numbers of samples in a short period of time and then do studies that are well powered and have a good chance for replicating downstream. We're going to now look at some of the descriptive statistics of the study and looking across these 200 subjects across the three different study arms. What you see in the left-hand side is a median of about 1800 proteins found in each of the samples and about 13,000 to 14,000 peptides that were actually seen. These represents two different levels of resolution of the plasma proteome. On the left-hand side, the traditional way of thinking about proteins, but I think the more appropriate way of thinking about it on the right-hand side are the peptides that are actually observed. There's a median of approximately seven peptides per protein seen. And if you recall from the earlier slide, that higher level of resolution really begins to reflect the tremendous diversity that's observed. Overall across the study, more than 2000 proteins were observed in 25% or more of the samples and more than 15,000 peptides were identified in more than 25% of the samples. This is a well-powered study. So when we looks at the total precision that was observed in these measurements, one can do power calculations to see where we are with respect to identifying biomarkers. On the left-hand side, you see the median precision for all three of these groups and please recognize that this represents the total biological noise between the individuals, sample collection, storage and processing noise, as well as measurement noise. So the full stack of noise as we refer to, it has a median precision of about 81%. On the right hand side, if you now do a power curve calculation to see how many samples do I need to be 80% sure to see a twofold change after Bonferroni correction of the significance levels, you can see that's about 42 subjects per arm of study. And recall, we have 50 in each of the AD and MCI. So with this platform, even though we're looking at more than 15,000 peptides and looking at more than 2,000 proteins, we still have excellent precision to go look for biomarker differences. On this slide, we can actually see what is the nature in terms of the depth of the profile and the annotation that we see of these proteins in the plasma proteome. What you see on this slide again is a matchup of detected proteins against the depth of the plasma proteome where a blue circle indicates an identified protein and the red circles and the text indicate high interest proteins based on open target scores for Alzheimer's disease. Open targets is a database that annotates on a scale from zero to one prior interest or knowledge about a given protein or genes involvement in a particular disease area. And what you see here are 27 high scoring open targets proteins that were observed in this study going forward. Now we're going to just do direct comparison of groups of, of subject samples. And in this first observation, we're gonna do a non-parametric Wilcox test to go look at the difference between control and disease. In this case, disease is, is Alzheimer's disease and MCI altogether. And what you see in the plot on the right-hand side is a, what we call a volcano plot. That is the difference of the log values of the different groups, higher or lower, versus their but uh, multiple testing adjusted p-value. And so higher is better there as well too. And anything above the line is a significant difference. And what you should take away is that there are many proteins between these diseased and the control group that were different, many high open target scoring proteins that were different between these two groups. If we actually split this now into just the 50 Alzheimer's disease subjects or the 50 mild cognitive impairment subjects, once again, you can see many significant proteins above the dashed line after multiple testing correction that are significantly different. And many of these are annotated as being high open targets, Alzheimer's disease related proteins. All of this confirming that the platform is doing an excellent job of, of profiling the plasma and looking at proteins both known and unknown to be involved in the disease. If we actually look now and see what are the differences between those groups of proteins, either respect to all the proteins or just the ones with the high uh, Alzheimer's open target score, on the left-hand side, you see the overlap or non-overlap of all. In the middle, you see for those proteins that were identified with high open target score, 
And on the right-hand side, you can see the names of those protein groups with their comprising Uniprot IDs as well as their gene symbols, suggesting that the platform is able to discern differences in the detected proteins between these two diagnostic groups. Now, if we go and ask, well, can I predict whether I'm in one class or the other, doing 10 rounds of cross-validation with random forced machine learning based uh, uh, applications, looking at Alzheimer's disease versus control, you can see that in that 10 rounds of tenfold classification, the 50 AD versus 100 controls, we've achieved excellent AUCs, AUC uh, of 0.98 across the 10 rounds. And that's exceptional and, and wonderful performance. But on the right-hand side, you see the more important story. Here are the 20 features in the random forest classifiers that were most important. And on the left-hand side, you can see their Uniprot IDs. And wherever there was an overlap to an open targets Alzheimer's disease protein with prior interest, the name of that gene is there and a color is there for what its score was. And the important takeaway is that those important features are a mix of previously known markers and unknown markers. So the classifiers basically put together a novel combination of known and unknown markers, enabling, enabling novel biological insights and potentially novel start points for diagnostics and therapeutics. Likewise, for myocognitive impairment versus control, the same story applies. Very good classification potential and cross-validation between MCI and control. And once again, the most important feature is representing a novel combination of known and unknown proteins. If we do the hard test now and ask, I'm going to look at the 50 Alzheimer's versus the 50 MCI patients and ask, do I see any evidence for a statistically significant symbol uh, difference? The answer is yes, with an AUC of 0.61. It's quite modest, but this is a small study, as I said before, a 50 versus 50. And the point of the platform is to say, could we do a 500 versus 500 study? Nevertheless, once again, we have a novel combination of known and unknown proteins that are contributing to the significant signal that represent a novel departure point for differentiating these two forms of neurodegenerative disease. Looking at this peptide, uh, I'm sorry, once again, at the uh, protein level differences between these groups at the peptide level, so going to a higher resolution now, I'm now looking at those proteins that are tagged by differentially expressed peptides and asking, do I see differences between these groups and do I see evidence for increased biological resolution? And the answer is yes. As you can see here, the numbers are slightly higher for the detected groups. And there are more proteins here that are tagged by differential peptides than just those proteins that are tagged by protein scores alone. And this highlights this increased a higher level of resolution that's enabled by the nanoparticle platform in terms of doing candidate biomarker study. So in summary, in this pilot study, looking at 200 subjects, we've in about six weeks time processed 200 samples and demonstrated that we can find novel combinations of known and unknown biomarkers. This represents an excellent departure point for future studies, both looking at the specific information that we found so far, as well as planning for studies that have much larger numbers of samples for improved power. Thank you very much for your attention.